Hello. Salam sejahtera. Tadia Wan Shang Hao. Good evening. First of all, I'm happy to know that we have some familiar parents and teachers joining us tonight. And can I just say that upfront, if you are not able to join us for the whole webinar today, please don't worry. We will have the whole recording on Blue Princess YouTube after the event, inclusive of all other webinars whereby you will learn practical tips and knowledge. Everything is available to you on demand on our YouTube. So a very warm welcome to the people who join us the first time tonight. My name is Faith. I'm the principal and a consultant speech language pathologist at Blue Princeton. Tonight, I'm honored to be joined by the other three experts from Blue Princeton, and I will introduce them right after this. So for those of you who may or may not have had a chance to look through our Facebook, our website, our Instagram, or even our Weibo, can I invite you as you listen to the webinar tonight, please feel free to sit back and also have a browse on our social media where you will find a lot of information about um, things that you would definitely be interested to learn about your child or your teenagers at home. And even something that is very beneficial for parents and teachers to incorporate at home and at school. So at Blue Prism, we are a team of experts who specialize in child and adolescent development from newborn all the way to 21 years old. So some people would say, wow, that is a wide range. But you know what? Imagine if you are a parent, even one day when your child is 80 years old, he or she is still always that baby in your heart, right? That is why we focus not just at a particular phase of a child's development, but we recognize that in each phase of life, there are things where the child or the teenager would have to adapt to it. And sometimes our environment may change. So that is why at Blue Prism, we take pride in specializing in supporting their growth and development all the way up to 21 years old. And right after that, we also offer that support to help transition them to the next phase of life, right? And at Blue Prism, you would have seen tonight, we have educators and clinical psychologists with us. And so we are a multidisciplinary expert team. And speaking of multidisciplinary team, tonight, can I invite you to think about one English word, compass. So C-O-M-P-A-S-S, -S, seven letter compass, and what comes into your mind. So for those of you who enjoy outdoor activities, you may be thinking about jungle trekking, um, or some of you who love movies, you will see that, oh, some people made, well, I'm not the best at outdoor. So this is what I learned from movie. Or well, if I get lost, compass is where I find directions. And when I'm at a place of feeling helpless, compass give me a sense of assurance. It is my companion in the times of worries, in the times where I feel I'm alone. So this is often what parents feel when they are being told that, oh, I think your child is somewhat different from other people. Or one day when you pick up your child from school and your teacher may say, I think there are some areas that are showing red flags. You may want to consult somebody who is a specialist in this area. And the first response from parents always during that time is, their heart will drop and we often receive phone calls where parents or even caregivers are crying over the phone. They have just no way to go. So that is why at Blue Prism, our multidisciplinary team is comprised of Compass, whereby if you would think about that seven letters with me, C starts from clinical and educational psychology team. And tonight we have Miss Evelyn, one of our clinical psychologists with us. And then moving on to the second letter, O, we have our occupational therapist team. And the third letter, M, we have our music 
and art therapies. And the fourth letter would be P. P stands for physiotherapist team. And then A, A stands for ABA. ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analyst Team. And the last two S, the first of the last two S, we have our Special and Inclusive Educators Team. And we have two of them with us tonight, Miss Hannah and Miss Genevieve. And last but not least, the last S is our Speech and Language Pathologist or Speech and Language Therapist Team. So without further ado, I would like to invite our speakers and our panelists tonight to share with us whether autism spectrum disorder, ASD, or in short, autism, is it a myth? Um, is it curable? Is it a behavioral disorder whereby I just need to get some kind of specialist or teachers over to train the behaviors and then magic happens? Or parents will think about, you know, sometimes I feel so tired. Like my child is on the spectrum. He or she just seem like they don't have emotions. They are just so oblivious about what I say. They just want to do their own things. So these two are just some of the things that our speakers and panelists will cover tonight. Right? So I will hand over to them. And please, if you have any questions, pop them into our Facebook Live, or you can also take this chance to WhatsApp us. Our business inquiry line is open until the end of this event. So over to you, Miss Hannah, and everyone, enjoy. Hi, everyone. So today we are going to be addressing actually several myths and truths as well uh, regarding autism. I'm sure that all of you have received news from WhatsApp or perhaps, you know, listen to people who have listened to other people talking about autism or perhaps even Google out certain um, facts or certain researches on your own and you have read up on them. So today we are going to be affirming certain truths that are right out there and as well as debunking certain myths that perhaps all this while people have been believing them, but actually they are not really backed by scientific um, research as well as findings. So um, for our first point, we'll actually be talking about, is it true that boys are more likely to be diagnosed with autism? And so um, this we will hand over to Miss Genevieve to, to discuss about this. Over to you, Jen. All right. Thanks, Hannah. Good evening, everybody. So as we go along, please feel free to um, join us in our debunking of myths in the comments. So if you think something is true, please put that in the comments. If you think something is a myth, go ahead and write that in. Um, don't be afraid if the answer is wrong, we're all here to learn and grow. So our first statement is boys are more likely to be diagnosed with autism than girls. Now this is a truth. So the thing with autism is, of course, it does affect girls. Um, however, it can look slightly different in girls. So one of the characteristics of autism is um, repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. And in girls, we found that um, girls are girls have tend to have more socially acceptable interests. So for example, if a boy um, with autism likes to spin the wheel of a car um, and he does it for a long period of time, um, that would look a bit abnormal. And that might be, you know, a, a indicator that something um, is going on there. Whereas a girl might um, have an interest in things like a doll. So she might just comb a doll's hair or play with bubbles and that looks on the surface, socially acceptable. Um, another thing is that girls are also better at masking their traits of autism. So they do that by imitating their more typical peers. And um, therefore they, they, they tend to um, appear, or uh, they tend to kind of fly under the radar a little bit. So um, having taken all of these things into account, um, there is still um, a greater prevalence of autism in boys. So um, boys are actually four times more likely to have autism than girls. The ratio is four, four boys to one girl. Um, some of the possible theories for this, we'll just briefly go through it. 
<clears throat> one lies in um, the structure of the brain itself. So um, the brains of males and females differ slightly. And um, one theory suggests that um, the structure of the male brain is, um, is, so, is such that it is um, simply more vulnerable to whatever structural changes that are brought about by autism. Um, another theory would suggest that um, autism is, is the excessive expression of um, the areas of the brain that are already more pronounced in boys. So these are some of the theories that, um, that, that support um, or can explain to an extent of why uh, boys are actually four times more likely than girls to be diagnosed with autism. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, I think um, definitely a lot of people often ask, uh, why is that that we see more boys diagnosed with autism? And you see more boys uh, in intervention programs as well as in special education programs. Uh, thank you for your explanation. Now we will go on to the next point where sometimes people wonder what actually is autism? You know, is it just purely behavioral? Is it just uh, because when people observe children, you know, behaving perhaps a little more naughty and uncontrollable than normal and it doesn't stop at certain age. So it makes people wonder, so is that what autism is? So um, we will have Miss Evelyn to answer this. Over to you, Evelyn. Thanks, Hannah. So the question is here, is autism just a behavior or a mental health disorder? So I'm going to give you like three seconds. You guys can just input the answers before uh, whether you're here on Facebook or um, this is uh, just reading this on YouTube. You can just put in the answer before and try to guess. Okay, let's have the answer. It is a myth. All right. So what exactly is autism? Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It is not a behavioral um, disorder. It is not a mental health disorder. Why we distinguish it such is that there's this assumption, if it's just a behavioral issue, that means I see a behavioral expert and my kid will be fine already. Or if it's just a mental health disorder, does it mean that once I put my kid on medication, then after that, the autism symptoms will be gone. So actually that's not true because like what Jen just said earlier, there's um, differences in the structure of the brain already. So one of the two main characteristics of autism is by what, number one, social communicative difficulties. They can't quite take initiative to communicate with others or understand some sometimes um, more unclear or verbal or non-verbal messages. And secondly, restricted or repetitive behaviors. So this is where the point about challenging behaviors come in. Um, it is mainly due to them having different ways of processing stimuli or the need for routines. So you, you might have heard about the word steaming. So steaming actually refers to repetitive behaviors that children with autism sometimes engage in to sort of self-soothe. So what you will see on the surface is why is this kid with autism always jumping around? Or this kid is just walking on his toes. This is weird. Why is he flapping his arms, um, slapping tables, or even just chewing toys in the mouth? But there could be a, a lot of reasons for why the kid is engaging in these behaviors. It could be a lack of sleep. It could be a lack of stimulation. So when certain experts are brought in, they are able to identify what exactly is the problem and advise better on how to reduce steaming or challenging behaviors. And when we talk about autism spectrum, spectrum disorder, the word spectrum there actually refers to differences in abilities, in behaviors, and the severity of symptoms. No two kids with autism actually look alike. And this one will be expanded on by both Genevieve and Hannah later. So maybe Jen can then let us know, since it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, when can we figure out that there's actually a disorder? All right, thanks, Evelyn. So 
Our, that brings us to our next statement, which is autism can be detected as early as 18 months. So I think three seconds is a good, uh, good time frame, Evelyn, for people to put in their answers. So if you have any guesses, please guess now, or forever hold your peace. Um, it is a truth. So there is um, a population of children who appear to develop normally um, for the first two years of life. Um, and then they appear to um, lose the skills that they have um, obtained developmentally. Um, however, there is also a large population of children who um, from as early as 18 months um, show several red flags or show several um, early signs of autism. So um, yeah, it can be detected um, as early as 18 months and um, moving forward. So let's just go through some of um, early signs briefly. Um, the first red flag um, would be unusual visual fixations. So um, as mentioned earlier, stimulation is good. Stimulation is very important in child development. Um, however, when a child starts to be unusually fixated on a particular um, visual stimulant, um, or show very intense focus, very persistent examination of something, um, show distress when the object is removed, it can be classified as an unusual fixation. Um, the next red flag would be abnormal repetitive behavior. So um, this is your stimming behavior um, and it can be um, through a person's um, body itself, like body movements, for example, um, jumping around, flapping the hands, rolling the fingers, or it can be um, through use of other objects or toys, so spinning the wheels, um, taking an object apart and putting it back together and doing this uh, for a prolonged period of time. So generally, children might show curiosity and they might do these things, but you know, after one or two minutes, they will probably get bored of it and do something else. Whereas um, it becomes abnormal when for 30 minutes, a child is still doing the same thing. Um, so then that would be a red flag. Um, the next red flag would be a lack of age appropriate sound development. So children start by babbling, they make word approximation. So they start saying the words, it's not quite there yet, but you can kind of understand. And then they start saying the words. Um, so I, I cite a, a renowned pediatrician, Dr. Amar Singh, and he said the general rule of thumb is by the age of 18 months, a child should say at least six meaningful words. Um, and this doesn't include a rote language. So nothing that is um, recitable, such as uh, your numbers or your alphabets or from a song. Um, so these are these are meaningful um, things because language is a transactional. So things like mom, things like dad, boy, ball, car, milk, something that shows function and meaning. Um, so that is a good indicator um, of where a child should be at. Um, at the very least at the age of 18 months. So if a child um, is lacking in that, then that could also be a red flag. Next, we have a delayed intentional communication. So this is when there's um, neutral facial tones. So usually, typically, when you smile at the child, you make a funny face, um, the child will respond. Um, if not verbally, then the child will show in their face, um, you know, a happy expression, uh, some, some sort of facial reaction. Um, however, when there's a lack of that, then um, that might be a warning sign. Um, other things would include um, a lack of pointing, a lack of gesturing, um, any sort of um, lack in way of getting attention of the parents. So for example, when a child wants help with something, instead of pointing at the object that they want help with, they might just take your hand and drag you to the object or drag you to where they want to go. Um, and finally, we have a decreased interest in interaction. So 
children with autism sometimes show um, more interest in objects than in people. Um, and they have difficulty to sustain face-to-face -face interaction. So um, this, this kind of overlaps with my point earlier of, um, you know, when you smile at the child, they smile back. Um, and and uh, moving further into that is um, when a child is playing or having fun or enjoying a certain toy or a certain object, um, the child's focus might not be on the adult to, to share in that enjoyment <clears throat> or to invite them to share in that, that pleasure, but the attention would just be on the object itself. Um, also things like lack of eye contact, lack of joint attention um, is also um, part of decreased interest in interaction. So all these are early signs of autism in infants. Um, usually, pediatricians or psychologists will not give a formal diagnosis until the child is about three years old. Um, however, before that, if these signs are noted, um, the child would have um, either a suspected ASD diagnosis or a suspected delay, and or they will be recommended to receive um, early intervention services or receive the appropriate services. So there's no need to wait until, you know, a child is formally diagnosed with autism to get services. But um, the earlier these signs are noted, um, the earlier the child can get support. Uh, which brings us to our next point. Autism can be cured. So speaking of support and all that, Evelyn, what are your thoughts on curability of autism? Mm -hmm. I think this is something that most teachers, educators, and parents are interested in. How can we put a stop to autism or whatever symptoms that we see, whether it is difficulties communicating or even repetitive behavior? And this is the question of the century as well. Can autism be cured? What do you guys think? The answer is that this is a myth. Unfortunately, the early initial research on autism tried to look into whether there's a cure, but they could not find any. They found that autism is actually a lifelong condition. And this is why the word spectrum comes into play, because all the symptoms are so different. The severity is different. And hence, it is hard to say, okay, just by engaging in this, there will be a cure for autism. Or just by taking this magic pill, then there will be a cure for autism. However, understanding that it is a lifelong condition, you know that um, growth can actually occur at any time. They are still capable of learning and of growth at any stage of their lives. But how do you actually spot a fake cure? Hmm. The first thing you will notice is there's this word that come up such as like miracle or this is the end to autism. Secondly, you will find that there will be no medical evidence for whatever that is suggested. I recently received um, a question from one of the parents of a kid with um, autism. So this parent heard from another parent that apparently getting that child to engage in hate stance, meaning standing upside down, it will actually relieve or reduce or cure symptoms of autism. So um, if you're slightly more educated, you obviously know already um, that this, is, this has no medical evidence, but sometimes um, you have to understand that parents are in a desperate state and they desperately want to have a cure. So remind people around you, if there is no medical evidence that shows that there is a cure for autism, don't engage in it. Because the third point is that it usually costs a whole lot of money. Supplements, plans, um, exercise routines, uh, and, and, and you just have to pay attention to these three things to have you spot a fake cure. Now, what then can we do? What are the best practices for supporting people with autism? So the first of all, we recommend psychoeducation for families. 
this is important because sometimes there's a lot of question marks still. For example, uh, sometimes people still talk about vaccines being the cause of autism because of um, a controversial study that happened many years ago. It led to a lot of doubts in parents who are now um, anti-vaxxers. So this was pre-COVID time. So now when we say anti-vaxxers, we refer to COVID, but before that, um, it was referring to those who were fearful that their kids would get autism. So the um, evidence and the research has come in that uh, autism has nothing to do with vaccine at, at all. Other than understanding um, a fact like this, uh, second thing is placing uh, your child with autism into a structured, intensive educational placement. If your child is still young, it's actually an advantage because it means that they have more potential, they have more time for growth and for learning. Thirdly, we also look into skills training. Skills training refers to social skills, refers to how to take care of yourself, refers to communication skills. And this is done in a way that is customized for a child with autism. Meaning, when we understand that the child has difficulties in communication, tends to engage in repetitive behavior, we try to find out what are some of the other ways to reach out to the kid to make sure that they still pick up on these skills. And also, we'll be looking at behavioral intervention. So this is a best practice because of the challenging behavior we mentioned earlier. Sometimes they engage in it in a harmful manner because um, they want to soothe themselves, but they don't know any other ways of doing it without hurting themselves. So when you have an expert coming in to intervene on these behaviors, it teaches them how to cope with certain unpleasant or sensitivity to sensory or stimuli without harming themselves and causing um, inconvenience or maybe difficulties to people around them. Do know that it's a long-term um, uh, planning and all these best practices. So every time transition happens, you will definitely need to engage in the appropriate expertise. So when we talk about structured educational placement, sometimes um, teachers or educators will be like, hmm, can a kid with autism actually learn? So Hannah, Hannah is here to tell us like what kind of education or what is appropriate? Well, I think as what um, Evelyn mentioned just now about autism actually being a spectrum. So autism actually comes in a spectrum of actually endless combination of learning needs. So there is no such thing as, oh, um, my child has autism because uh, his set of symptoms is exactly the same as perhaps another child with autism because every child, uh, when they are diagnosed with autism, Learning challenges, each challenge is actually placed on different levels and also at different developmental aspects. So actually, um, there, there is an endless combination of these. So no child is the same. So same thing with their education as well. Uh, no child receives the exact same set of education simply because education for them is accommodated specifically to their learning needs. So when a child with autism uh, comes to... Uh, centers for services with early intervention or special education programs. Um, these programs have strategies that are designed specifically to help them overcome uh, their set of learning challenges, right? And all these um, strategies, the end goal in mind, especially for early intervention programs, is actually to help them transition into schools. So what happened is that uh, in these strategies, uh, teachers will implement certain accommodations or modifications to learning methods as well as um, the curriculum to help them to attain the academic level as well as the developmental level that is needed uh, or required for them to transition into uh, normal schools or mainstream schools. So kindergartens, normal kindergartens, private schools, even government schools. So um, these are the goals of actually an early intervention program. However, uh, there are certain children who perhaps need uh, more extensive support uh, in their education. So perhaps an EIP will not be enough, then they will go into what we call special education program. So special education program will provide them with the extra support that they will need uh, as 
they go on with their education. Some go on to perhaps uh, secondary school level, tertiary, le tertiary level is even possible uh, with, with uh, enough intervention uh, given for them to overcome their learning challenges. And perhaps some, they will need uh, modified education styles and curriculum to suit their learning needs. But however, uh, just to bear in mind that, uh, for example, at Blue Prism, uh, us special inclusive educators, when we offer EIP programs, uh, definitely the best interest for your child in our minds uh, and in our programs is that uh, we hope to help them transition into uh, a school so that they are able to they are able to uh, mingle with their peers uh, as well as to develop alongside their peers. So that's the end goal. Yeah. And I think um, just wanting to expound more on whether is autism the same for everyone because we talk about a lot about you know autism being on the spectrum and uh, autism coming with its own uh, very different combinations of challenges. We will have Jen to expand more on this for us. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. So as mentioned by both Hannah and Evelyn, um, if you've been paying attention, you would be able to answer this one correctly. Um, so actually, it is a myth. Autism does not look the same in everyone. Um, there is a number of shared difficulties by individuals with autism. So the areas of shared difficulties are in things like communication difficulties, repetitive behaviors, your stimming, um, social impediments, difficulty understanding social interactions, um, changes in uh, sensitivity to change and stimulations with uh, your sensory issues and then motor difficulties. So somebody um, with autism might have difficulty in like two people might have difficulty in all this area. Let's just let's just look at this slide. So in general, we like to think of the autism spectrum as a linear line, like linearly. So on one hand, we have people with um, high traits of autism and we would label them as severe autism. And then we would have people who have um, lower traits of autism and we would label them mild autism. So one is on you know, this side of the spectrum, the severe side, and then we have other people on that side of the spectrum, which is the milder side. Um, However, this, this model is non-inclusive because it discounts so much of what autism actually is. Um, as mentioned previously by both Hannah and Evelyn, it is probably more beneficial to look at autism um, in this kind of graph because autism can affect somebody in the same areas of difficulty, but um, be very different in degree of difficulty. So somebody might have very severe um, aggression, but very mild depression, have moderate fixations, and have mild abnormal speech. While another person might have difficulties in these this same four areas, but have very mild aggression, very severe depression, moderate fixations, and very intense abnormal speech. So while the areas of difficulty are the same, the degrees of difficulty vary from individual to individual. So two people can have autism and present very differently in their symptoms. So diff differing degrees of difficulty means different presentation of symptoms. And that is important to note because the, the, the support that one will have to receive um, is very dependent on their symptoms. So for example, somebody with um, aggression or sensory issues would have a different intervention plan than somebody with um, fixations or social impediments. So all this is um, important to bear in mind um, as educators, as parents, as people in the field, um, because of 
the different methods of support that we need to provide. Um, so moving on, speaking of you know support and 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 um, being able to to differ from individual to individual, can children with autism actually go on to lead independent lives? Because we've seen that um, you know there's there's such a a vast area and vast endless possibilities um, of difficulty. So is there hope? Can somebody with autism actually lead an independent life? Uh, Hannah. Yeah, I think to all those who are listening from whatever that you've gathered so far uh, from the points that you've listened to, as well as perhaps things that you've heard about autism before, do you think that uh, children with autism can and is capable of living their own lives uh, without intervention, uh, being independent. Well, um, I think from our us teachers as well as practitioners' experience, um, that this is a definite truth. Uh, but I would say that the degree of independence is always subjective to how extensive um, the symptoms are, as well as how early the interventions are provided. So when we talk about intervention, well, what do we even call intervention is because uh, these things, uh, these strategies are put in place in order to help them overcome certain challenges. So we intervene uh, whenever there's any difficulties in certain aspects to help them to actually go uh, uh, to overcome them as well as adopt perhaps certain strategies that they can hold on to whenever they encounter similar issues, right? And so interventions will help them to actually build very solid uh, foundational skills to help them in their development. And uh, this is very uh, important uh, and should be done as early as possible, which was why we also talked about how early um, autism can be diagnosed or can be realized. And so I would say the key to um, whether can the child be independent or not is actually how early and how effective is the intervention. So there is two points to this. First is receiving timely support. So once you know, uh, don't be shy. Uh, don't be afraid, but to reach out to um, the resources that you have, reach out to the practitioners uh, to find out more. How, how, how much further can you help your child? You know? uh, what are the aspects that your child perhaps need assistance with? Right? And then secondly, is receiving adequate support. I think with what Evelyn mentioned just now, uh, that interventions, uh, you, you won't be receiving interventions uh, just once in your life, you know, or even your child's life, uh, and that's it, right? Because learning difficulties, even for us, learning challenges crop up uh, along the way, even all the way to when we are 50 years old, 60 years old, you know, they are still going to be learning challenges. So um, the key to this is actually receiving adequate support that is um, suitable for the learning challenges as well. So as they move on um, with their life, as they move on down um, their education road, right? Uh, there will be very different sets of challenges in primary school, in kindergarten, high school, as well as in university. So there are a lot of cases, you know, where uh, people with autism who go on uh, with the tertiary education, I do know a few, and actually assume uh, professional careers uh, because of the interest in it, right? Uh, so some parents hope that, you know, um, I do need my child to have a job, you know, I just want them to be able to take care of themselves, right? Uh, in special education, we do teach your child how to take care of themselves uh, and to see in which area are they uh, facing difficulties with and that the, in that area will provide help and assistance with, right? There are some who perhaps move on to more technical based um, jobs or even uh, means of living because uh, simply because of their interest, just like any of us, all, uh, all of us have our own interests and strengths. Same thing with children with autism, all of them have their own set of interests as well as their strengths. And so it is to us, um, educators, practitioners, as well as family, to help them to discover that and to help them to explore into their area of interest, right? So uh, parents, there is always hope. But uh, do reach out, right, whenever you feel that you are stuck or whenever, uh, once you find out, in fact, once you find out that um, perhaps there is something my child uh, is missing from his or her development, do reach out. And uh, that's my only encouragement for you because um, I think a lot of parents, uh, perhaps they would say things like, um, let me wait a few more years and perhaps um, 
this this um, difficulty will disappear down the road, right? Uh, uh, please don't do that. All right. Uh, the moment you find out, uh, reach out to us. Yeah. So I think um to to close off today's session about autism, let's go on to one point that um a lot of people assume about people with autism. Uh, I I think maybe because a lot of people with autism don't show very um colorful facial expressions, you know. So they uh there are a lot of assumptions around them. People with autism don't have emotions or they don't feel much, right? Hopefully, what do you have to say for that? I actually have a joke to tell. <laughs> okay, so bear with me, guys. So there's this German shepherd who entered a telegram office. So he took a blank form and wrote down woof, 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 woof. So the clerk, being very polite and very um, accommodating, took the form, looked at it and said, um, you only wrote down eight words. And you know that if you throw in one more word, um, it's, it's the same price. Why don't you just add one more woof? Then the dog replied, that would make no sense at all. Yep. Yes. So that was a joke. <laughs> So if you had difficulties understanding or if you was like, where's the humor and all that? That is probably exactly how a child or a person with autism would feel as well. So to the question, people with autism don't feel emotions. This is a myth. Yep. So let's take a look into a few different points. The first being that for someone with autism, it is not them being disinterested or unwilling when they refuse to communicate in the same way that you expect. So uh, those with autism, they are actually keen to reach out too, but sometimes they refrain or they do not make the expected response because social communication makes them feel confused. Like all the whoops I did just now, it can be confusing to certain people. To the next point, they have different drives. So for um, you and I, we might have the drive to socialize because when we find out that this person has something in uh, a mutual interest or something in common with the other person, it gives us um, a shot of pleasure and we feel like, oh, um, this is someone I can talk to um, and this motivates us to continue socializing. For someone with autism, they might not have the same drive to be motivated. They might not have the same uh, or the same intense pleasure that you might feel, and therefore, they may refrain from engaging in some communication. Moving on to the third point, they actually feel sensitive to certain stimuli in the environment. So it's hard for them to want to share something with you, want to jointly watch the same thing as you are, because they are very sensitive to certain stimuli like noise, light, or touch. So if you think along these lines, does it mean then that they actually feel more emotion compared to us then? Something to think about. And the last point being social communication difficulties. So we've touched on this the whole night. It's hard for them to understand jokes because they take things literally. It's hard for them to take turns because Number one, they might not be giving you that um, same amount of eye contact. They might not pay attention to verbal or non-verbal cues that you are giving out. And therefore, they have difficulties taking turns. Or offering empathy. Because the way they understand the world is so different that they might not be able to put themselves in your shoes to understand how you might relate or feel in a certain situation. Okay. So I'm going to pass it back to Hannah to bring us through. Yes, um, I think that's the end of um, today's session on debunking memes as well as affirming certain truths around autism. I'll pass this time to Faith. Uh, she will have some questions to direct to us. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, Miss Ithleen, Miss Hannah, and Miss Genevieve. You know, when I was listening throughout, there are so many 
very informative visuals as well as um, key points that the three of you mentioned that I wish I could have just, you know, have my camera ready to, or if I'm on my laptop to just screenshot or just take a picture. And you know, as a practitioner and as well as someone who walks the journey with many families and parents, I think some of those diagrams um, that shows how a person, whether a child or a teenager on the spectrum, what are some of their needs and also the prospect of their future life? I think that is very important. And oftentimes, um, you know, one of the main questions that parents um, often call me up and ask is, I'm going to start it from the parents who first receive the news, right? So in real life, I do have a few examples of parents calling up and they are all in their tears. So they would, they are very emotional at that point. And the first thing somehow commonly they said was, where do I seek a second opinion? How can I be sure that my child is really on the autism spectrum? I really, really just wanted um, the answer. So I think there is also something that lingers on the minds of many parents, whether or not they share it with somebody. Because we also know a lot of parents who actually, they do not want to come into the light and they try to find answers on their own. So I think I would perhaps will ask, let's maybe start from this evening. Um, so if we have a parent who is either suspecting or actually have the news being uh, broken to them from a pediatrician, from from an educator or from even a psychologist, so someone who is qualified to diagnose, what would you advise them to do on the whole as the first few steps? Mm -hmm. Usually when um, a parent is coming in and feeling really distressed, um, on the first hand, I think you need to understand that there is probably a whole lot of factors that actually come into play. So it could be um, certain family dynamics. Is it um, difficult for them to actually care for the child and therefore facing and feeling all these difficulties, accepting a diagnosis of autism? It could be uh, the process of grief. Uh, all parents, they definitely do not expect to have a child with difficulties. That will be the process of grief, grieving for the um, ideal or uh, the original picture that they had of the child growing up to lead a happy or normal life. It could be culture because we're, um, although Malaysia is slowly working towards um, understanding or having more acceptance or more education on what autism is, just like this talk that we're having, not all parents or not all population have equal access to this kind of resources or information. Perhaps they feel like it is um, a social stigma. Is it uh, a point of shame? Could it be um, them blaming themselves for um, certain parenting styles that they feel like could have led to that um, diagnosis of autism? So understanding how all these factors come into play, you have to come to a point of empathy and reach out to the parent. If, let's say, that the pediatrician or the psychologist uh, may not have um, explained certain things clearly, we could move on to psychoeducation. What exactly is autism? How to support your kid? how to um, even reach out or get more resources. If there are certain things that you have questions about, we could still move on with a further diagnosis using um, good standard tools um, for them to understand whether they are areas of um, delayed developmental milestones or even confirming on the diagnosis in a way that they will be able to accept and understand and along with that, um, a psychologist would also have behavioral observations by pointing out and relating to them in a way that these are certain behaviors that are indicative of autism. This, is, um, this, this could be a, some reasons why your child is behaving in a way that you do not understand. So this is how we would approach it in a holistic manner to help uh, the parent um, move through any difficulties, whether in the diagnosis or whether in acquiring support at the uh, later stages. Thank you so much. I think one of the key points mentioned here is empathy. And 
you know, whether as a practitioner or some of you who join us tonight, even though you may not be someone in, you may not be a professional, but sometimes even as a friend or as a family member, to be there with the parents or the caregiver to explore what is next. I think that is the most, one of the most important gesture, right? Um, and speaking of diagnosis, I think maybe Miss Hannah or Miss Genevieve can share more with us. You know, sometimes parents, yeah, they, they perhaps went on for a second opinion, but they, as, a, as a process of grief in reality, that parents at the back of their mind, they may still have reservation and they may think that, why not I get started with some sort of educational programs or some sort of therapy and let's see if my child would sort of grow out of it or my child would eventually as age catch up, he or she would seem less autistic, right? So I think one thing that um, I personally feel is while the diagnosis is important, but from the two, like from your perspective, is there something else that we can actually do with or without a diagnosis, or even when we are still in the stage of exploring a diagnosis? And then if, what are some of the things that parents should think about and consider? I think um, a lot of parents, I think uh, Faith, you know, as well, um, come to us uh, with reservations regarding the development of their child, but yet um, also have reservations about uh, obtaining an official diagnosis. Um, perhaps there are certain fears or stigma surrounding it, and it's taking time to sink in. So sometimes parents come to us, um, educators, I always joke with Jen that we are like a one-stop center uh, for everything. <laughs> you know, parents come to us and they just say, um, you know, um, be behavioral, you know, be it even um, difficulty with eating. Uh, teacher is the, the, the solution, you know, the answer to all these issues, right? So a lot of, uh, we, we do come across a lot of parents with uh, children whom they do not know what to do. Uh, so they depend on us to give them perhaps a direction, you know. Uh, what I would say is we can't give you an answer to all your issues, but what we can do is actually to direct you uh, to the professionals that can help you while, uh, while the need for diagnosis sink in. Definitely a diagnosis will help provide a more guided as well as a more solid um, direction for us to design, for even for any practitioner to design uh, a, a solid plan and strategies uh, for your child, right? So normally what we do is to actually, um, in basics, just assess what your child needs, in what, in which area of development are they lacking in, um, which area of development are they facing um, most difficulty in, as well as uh, perhaps some, you might think that your child is facing difficulties in, but actually uh, it's they're being completely normal in that area, right? So, and then um, what uh, what I will do is actually to direct them to uh, the, the professional that will be able to address the issue directly. For example, if you have parents who come to us, you know, with children with uh, behavioral issues that they're not able to handle. Sure, teacher is a, teachers are able to handle to a certain extent um, behavioral issues implement certain behavioral management strategies, but it comes to a point where uh, they need to be channeled to perhaps um, you know, behavioral analyst, behavioral therapist uh, to help them overcome those challenges better. Same thing with problems with feeding, you know, problems with um, uh, their oral speech. You know, there are certain things that us teachers are not able to address uh, specifically, then we will have to direct them to practitioners like um, speech language um, pathologists. So, I think first of all, we will definitely have to see in which areas and then whether are we able to address them. If not, who will be better to address them? Yeah, yeah and I think I'll just add that um, one thing that I do like to highlight is like what Hannah mentioned, it's the areas of need. Instead of focusing so much on the diagnosis um, or lack thereof, I would just focus on the need instead. So um, we do um, developmental assessments. So we ascertain areas of development where the child is lacking. And um, I actually had a parent recently tell me um, that um, one, one, um, 
psychologist told her that the child has autism and then another one said that the child doesn't have autism. So I said, you know what, it doesn't, at this point, what is important is getting his needs met. So let's look at his milestones and let's work on that instead. Let's get his development up to par. And then, you know, when the time comes, you can go get a third opinion at this point. Um, so I think it's very important for parents to get help um, and it not be maybe labeled or packaged if they are, um, you know, um, feeling some type of way about it or there's a stigma involved. Um, however, to as, as educators, I think um, it's our responsibility to just give the help um, and give them the knowledge. So knowledge is power, right? And the more that the more you educate the parents, um, like what even mentioned, um, the more they are understanding, and the less um, stigma there is around the subject of autism. So the more they understand what it is, and the more they understand what their child actually needs, then you see them be less um, defensive when it comes to. Um, the label or the diagnosis. Um, I actually had parents um, come to me and the, the one parent is bringing the child in for intervention and the other parent is completely against um, the diagnosis. It's a complete denial of the diagnosis. Um, but, you know, there is this one parent who is like, okay, my child needs help and I'm, I'm getting the help. So in that, you know, in, in, in situations like that, you just support the parent emotional support, you have to be empathetic, you have to be understanding, um, you really have to, um, you know, understand the dynamics, again, like what you mean, you have to understand family dynamics, and just support the child um, as best as you can, so yeah, that's my take. I think we have even come to a point that, from what I'm hearing, we also trying to think from a parent's or caregiver's perspective. Like, for instance, what the three of you have pointed out is, we certainly, out of love, will put the needs of our children at the forefront. So that would involve parents spending their time, their energy. And I think the other component that is often very realistic and very, very important, but less being discussed is the money. The cost. So I actually have some inquiries um, that directed to us that says, you know, we know that a child with autism or core diagnosis, in other words, autism and other diagnosis, um, they would need ideally a holistic therapy and education program. But to our family, this is going to be expenses after expenses and expenses. And just as the three of you have shared, with the hope that my child will go on and lead a rather independent life. But when I know the diagnosis as parents, I sort of feel that I will have quite a lifelong responsibility to perhaps probably have to invest a little more than if I would have a typically growing child. Right. So, do the three of you think um, there, there is something whereby parents can also do in the home setting that we discuss about what teachers can do, um, what therapists or practitioners like psychologists can do? I'm just thinking, because there are a group of parents who will say, who will be very proactive and ask, is there something that I can just do even five minutes a day? But that will really help to, when I send my child to you, um, you for therapy, you can then work on something new. You can build upon that fundamental skills from last week. But I'm not just sending my child in to do the same thing every session. Right. So I perhaps I would invite Miss Evelyn to start this off about the roles of parents um, without adding further too much a burden on them. But what are some of the simple things that they might be able to do at home? Hmm. All right. I think from from um uh, understanding a behavior of a kid with autism or understanding family dynamics as a whole, um, some of the basic needs of um, the child has to be met. And one of the main things that kids love is attention. 
attention from the parents, attention from their loved ones. So um, if you're saying that there's something simple that you can start doing, it could be as simple as just praising your kid whenever they are engaging in a behavior that you think is appropriate or good. So if we're going to um, specify it in the context of a child with autism, so perhaps if he doesn't really um, reach out much or initiate too much interaction, when he does, what are some of the ways that you can um, then praise or give attention that the child will be able to feel that this is a behavior that is loved by or liked or desired by the parents and therefore the child will be encouraged to do it more times, more frequently. So attention could be in the form of going down to your child, squatting down, letting them know that you're looking at them, having the full attention and saying, good job. It could be patting them on the back. It could be patting them on the head. So the purpose is that the child knows that when they engage in this behavior, they get the attention of the parents and it's a form of social praise, which will encourage them to engage in more behaviors similar to that or the same behavior so if you're saying that let's just start doing one thing it will be to praise your kid whenever they are doing something right that's from me yeah i think um on my end what i do find that a lot of parents perhaps um, are not aware about is actually uh, the, the developmental milestones that uh, all of us refer to whenever we want to know whether is a child's development on par with their age, right? And so I think developmental milestone is one uh, very available resource that all parents can access. And uh, in fact, if you do not know where to access, you can even ask um, your child's doctor for it, right? And being aware, why is it so important to be aware of uh, the developmental milestone is because it helps you to track your child's uh, development at every stage, you know, starting from monthly, you know, at two, uh, one month, two months, three months, to being at, um, uh, at one year old, two year old, and three year old, and so on and so forth, right? So being able to track will help you, will keep you alert about, you know, uh, is there anything um, missing, any skills missing, you know, or is there anything that is deficit in terms of your development? And there are also suggestions from the doctor's side as to what can you do to make up for these deficits. You know, even sometimes simple things, simple games such as playing peekaboo with your baby will help your, your baby to help uh, increase the awareness of um, uh, you as a parent, increase their engagement with the people around them. So um, sometimes these are the things that we do very naturally, you know, like uh, just doing chat with the kid, you know, things like this, but we don't know uh, the, the weight of the significance of this small activity. So I would say, um, to keep track with your child's milestone and whenever it's missing, consult your doctor because uh, every child has their own pediatrician. Um, they, they have their own doctors that you go to whenever um, your child falls sick, right? So uh, all these doctors have the available information that uh, you need you know, to, in order to keep track of your child. So that will help you to stay informed as much as possible, as well as um, help to lessen certain worries that sometimes might arise uh, from certain suspicions or maybe stories from other people. Yeah, and one more thing that's really, um, sounds really simple, but can be a bit of a challenge would be keeping to a routine. So um, if your child has some semblance of a routine and it's and they stick to that routine, then the interventions or whatever sessions that your child has um, would go more smoothly. And that is because the child is, um, you know, well fed, well watered, well cleansed, um, has enough sleep. And therefore, the child's um, state of mind, the child's well-being is at an optimum level. So um, then when the child comes into the classroom or a session or whatever it is, um, they are more able to learn. So the child's basic needs always have to be met um, before learning can occur. So if you want to um, do something that helps, in addition to all the other things mentioned, um, it will be to make sure that um, they, they are at their optimal level so that learning can take place and take place um, rapidly.
that was so well said. I think, you know, the four points sound simple. You know, it's, it sounds like, well, I know it, but I think the real thing is coming down to doing it and keeping with it every day. And it is so true that what the three of you shared that if parents could just spend, you know, they don't need to put over expectations on themselves to be perfect in doing all these four things every day. But if they would just remember to do it at least once per day and then build it up from there, praise, keeping with the routine, um, spend time with your child, giving the attention and through that, observe their developmental milestones, you know, and with technologies today, use your camera to record down your child's minor differences each day. And when you look back, sometimes you will surprise yourself, I think, right? So coming to the end of today's session, I, I thought it would be really valuable to perhaps um, discuss a little bit about what parents should expect when their child grows into the primary and the secondary years. So I think this is um, unfortunately where a lot of parents feel the gaps are. So yeah, I, I, I keep a lookout on development milestones, et cetera. So for instance, one of the most frequent um, complaints or concerns is when a child gets into primary school, into a group setting, the, the parents feel, all right, now speech, everything has caught up, but my child is socially so awkward he or she would just rather go to the corner and do his or her own thing. And I, I believe there are some, also some other struggles that will sort of carry on into the later stages in life. So from your experience, um, I, I will keep this open. So feel free to share from any angle what parents should be prepared for or think about for their child when they move on to a later stages in life. Would miss if you like to Start? Okay, um, definitely can. Um, I think one of the things that we usually address in um, a psychological intervention would be how to uh, manage distressing situations. So just because your child has caught up to the stages where it's appropriate for learning, for speech, uh, does not mean that the symptoms of autism therefore disappear. They will still have difficulties in terms of social communication and they may also still need to rely on certain behaviors um, to help them cope or soothe themselves when it's in an environment that they find uh, too um, sensitive or too stimulating for, or under stimulating for them as well. So when you look at it this way, I think the first thing is to uh, have parents modulate your expectations. So there is progress, but it doesn't mean that the symptoms disappear. So uh, do not expect your kid to go into school suddenly having a lot of best friends and chit-chatting with them, like, like almost like, um, uh, all, like they don't have difficulties with communication. Difficulties will still be there, even though they have picked up on certain skills. So help your kid find uh, what is the best way. Uh, maybe you can role model or, or can just, you know, go through certain role modeling uh, in terms of uh, what a situation is going to be like. So let's say if it's recess and you're feeling overly stimulated, what are some things you can do? Is there a place that you feel safe? Is there something um, that could help you cope? Is it something as simple as a breathing exercise? Or what are some of the ways that actually um, is, is most suitable for your kid? So uh, talking through it and uh, practicing and letting them know that there is a way to cope through will definitely help with distress, will definitely help with uh, some of the other challenges that may happen as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I would also be interested to hear from um, the educators in terms of like what they would actually recommend. Um, I think um, as an educator, what uh, I normally talk to parents about oh, whenever they raise this concern, especially in terms of um, the academics level, right, uh, is to actually find out, you know, what are your child's learning styles? What are their learning preferences? You know, are they more visual learners? Are they more audio learners? Is that why um, sometimes they are not able to grasp certain um, learning content, you know, as fast as others? 
perhaps um you know um parents sometimes think oh maybe my child's not hardworking enough or maybe they're not talented in you know that that specific um subject matter right but sometimes it is not that sometimes it's perhaps the way that the content is delivered to them does not meet um their learning style and so they're not able to digest the information as much and as quickly as um the peers around them who perhaps are able to adapt to the style that is delivered in right um i always think that um a lot of our education uh content out there uh, are catered to very visual learners right um because i do work with children with visual impairment and i do find that you know to a certain extent uh, uh, uh there is a certain um there, there is a certain uh, amount of curriculum that we are unable to deliver to those uh, who have visual impairment simply because the, the, the education content is tailored around uh, those who learn visually. And so without that uh, visual imagery, right, uh, things become very abstract and they're not able to imagine it. Right? So sometimes uh, when we teach kids, for example, simple concepts like, so what is three plus three? And then you just get them to memorize six, you know, but then concepts behind it are not taught. Uh, yeah, the children are taught the value of the tree. You know, they're not taught that why why is three plus three equals to six? Why can't it be seven? You know, uh, so concepts like this when it's not delivered to the child or when it's delivered in a way that they're unable to grasp, that's when foundational skills are missing, which causes certain um certain areas of their studies later on uh are affected because of this. So I would say um be uh be aware of the child's learning style and uh don't be too quick to judge your child neither uh too quick to judge yourself uh it's not your child's fault it's not your fault uh that uh, perhaps they're not uh, they're not able to grab certain uh, content or concepts uh it's just perhaps they just need to learn it in another way and there are tons of ways out there available for your child to learn so once you figure this out you know you realize this then uh definitely there are people out there who will, will be able to help you so um i think uh, this this is one of the main points that I want to bring up from the education side. How about you, Jen? Um, I might just echo what you say with regards to delivery methods of materials in schools. Um, I've had kids who did really well in early intervention and then they went to primary school and it was not a pleasant experience, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of it is to do with, I mean, the main the main um, cause of anxiety was um, the social pressure, and then on top of that, they have to deal with um, the learning as well. So someone once told me that um, if the delivery of subjects is done um, and it is autism friendly, then it is friendly for everybody. Because children with autism are very, you know, they're very structured, very visual, um, very concrete learners. And so if something is broken down in a concept where somebody with autism can understand, it would benefit everybody. So um, I think it's it's um, it's a point of difference with, you know, the different kinds of schools that parents have to choose, have to end up choosing for their kids. Um, with autism especially. Um, unfortunately, there are some schools in our, our Malaysian system that are really not autism friendly. Um, so a lot of um, parents have to go to, have to choose things like, like homeschooling, um, international school, uh, schools where um, the subjects are, uh, or the materials are delivered in a way that is actually um, individually tailored or um, tailored to um, fit with their styles of learning um, better. Um, aside from that, I also um, like what you said, Evelyn, about practice. Um, you can teach social situations. You can you can teach them to you know interact. You can get them to practice and all that. But we are actually such complex social creatures. Um, I heard this story once about about a um, uh, seventeen year old boy with autism, and um, so he was taught growing up to take public transport. So he was able to do that independently, but um, he was taught to go find um, uh, a lady to sit next to, to you know, to keep him safe, lah. 
Um, so he would he would do this, and and it came time to um, where he was a fully grown adult, and he was this big buff guy, and the train is empty, and then he goes and sits next to a woman, and as a woman, if the train is empty and this big buff guy comes and sits next to you, you're like, oh, why? What's going on? Um, but to him, it was like, this is what I've been taught. And this is how I, I you know, stay safe um, in the environment. So, um, yeah, it, it really goes down to practice. It goes down to, unfortunately, sometimes it's trial and error. Um, you have to see what works and then what doesn't work and revert. And I think one, one thing as well as managing parental expectations is also to manage um, the individual's expectations and um, because they are, they are very sensitive creatures. And so it is to give them the understanding that, hey, it's okay if we did it wrong the first few times, um, but we'll work on it and we get better at it. Um, so yeah, but, but there's, I believe there's always hope and there's always room to, to learn and to grow. Yeah, I think as we, as the three of you shared, we would have realized that um, the stories and the bittersweet memories will, will change when we talk about a little young one and as they move into primary and then secondary. So um, just to echo what the three of you have mentioned just now during the Q&A as well as during your presentations that I think to all the parents and caregivers and teachers out there, um, while yes, it is inevitable that you will go through a roller coaster of emotions, and there will be days where you thought, hey, oh, things are looking better. And then the next day, it just seems to spiral down again. No. If I may encourage you, I believe um, Miss Evelyn, Miss Hannah, Miss Genevieve have gone through this with many families as well. That just like, even if you are raising a typically growing child today, there will also be futures where you will not know what would happen. And you will get surprises, whether pleasant or unpleasant surprises. So having the diagnosis is in a way, you just have, it just helps you to understand what your child needs and why he, or she would behave certain ways. But even you and I are different in many ways. So it's just one form of diversity. And that's why rather than labeling and say, oh, this is a child or the person who is autistic, or a person who, is, who has autism or on the spectrum, in today's world, sometimes we would say, um, this is someone or you and I both, all of us are someone who are neurodiverse, neuro, like you would know if you see a neuro, a doctor who specializes in the brain, right? So each of us, our brain is wired differently. So I hope that encourages you that um, while you put together and reach out to look for the help and support that you need, we are here and there are many other professionals out there as well. But as parents, I just, I think we just hope that your heart will be settled and you will embrace this journey with your family, with joy um, and with hope. Yeah. So thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Um, it's a great pleasure to hear from the three of you. Um, appreciate your time and appreciate those who join us on Facebook Live, who send in your inquiries privately to us. Um, I think this is such a meaningful night you know, to spend on a Saturday. And so let's wrap up here. Um, do take a break and then I will welcome you to come back to our YouTube sometime next week to just listen to all the information again and take your time to digest it. And if you have any questions or just any inquiries that you think, oh, could this be a stupid question? Don't worry about it. Just reach out to us. Um, we'll be happy to have a chat with you. So with that, I will close our session tonight. Take care and have a good weekend. Bye-bye, everyone.